All right, guys, today, episode 51, I'm with Mr. Uncle Lloyd Uwusu, my first footballer. Yes, yes. Well, I had Paul Lima on, but he's not a proper footballer. <laughs> bro. He's not a proper footballer. I actually wrote down, yeah, the clubs that you played for. Okay. Slough Town, Brentford, Sheffield Wednesday, Lone at Reading, Reading, Brentford, Yeovil, Cheltenham, Brighton, Adelaide, Luton, Hayes, Slough, White City, and then you played in Australia. Yep. That's what's a big list, man. That's a big list. It's almost like Michael Hector's loaning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless. How you doing? All good. Good. Bruv, it's good to see you. Good to finally see you. You've been here for, what, a couple of months and I'm not even seeing you yet, nephew. Yeah, all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even say nothing. It has been a mad schedule, but um, I want to explain to everyone why you're called uncle, because people are wondering, hold on a second. <laughs> He's Ghanaian, he's black. <laughs> Why is Darren calling him uncle? <laughs> Do you want to, you tell him. No, you know what it is? Ever since my playing career and many guys I've come across in my career, they've always been obviously younger than me and they've always sort of had a, uh, what's the right word to use? A sort of uh, feeling that they can come and talk to me and communicate to me with, for advice and everything. I just feel like when they're my young'uns, they're like my nephews. Yeah. So everyone, I've got so many, everyone says, oh no, you've got so many nephews. I go, yeah, because these are guys who, who I respect, people who respect me as well. And I just like to give back. So I guess all my youngsters out there, they're all my nephews. Well, yeah, and that's exactly why we call him uncle. And you, you actually did that for me when I played a little bit in Australia. Mm. It didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> I did you, I went from club to club. And it was so hard to find my feet here with trying to play football. And I couldn't tell if it was... And you were the only person I could actually talk to and you would actually understand where my head is at. Mm. Not only as like an athlete, but as someone that's coming from the UK and like the difficult difficulties that I had kind of sitting here. Mm. When you first came here, you came straight to the A-League. Yep. Right? And how was the transition from going from UK to that? We'll go back to UK football in a bit, but what was the transition like? Yeah, it was big, you know. Uh for me, unfortunately, I got struck down with swine flu and pneumonia. What? When I, yeah, when I first got here. No way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was when the pandemic back in 2000 and, yeah, 2009. Oh, so, shit. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, not many people know. You got hit hard? Hit hard. When I was one of the first footballers to get hit by it. So uh, I, got, I think I contracted it on the airplane. I remember, to be fair, when I was on it, I remember a woman behind me. She was coughing up the place. And uh, when I came here, I was sort of on the back burner. So like... I got here looking forward to a, a great opportunity in Australia. Uh, and then all of a sudden I started feeling really sick. Okay. Just like feeling cold and sweaty. And I said to the club doctor, time that I'm feeling really cold. So he goes, I know it's just a cold. But you know when you get a cold, you sort of know a couple of days you're getting better and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I just weren't getting better. After okay. a week, he's like, I know. Are you training at this point? I was I was training a bit, but then I was just I just couldn't my breathing was horrible. Okay. Felt weak. And I said to the doctor, look, I think I'm struggling. So he goes, No, I don't I don't think you've got swine flu. Let's just t just uh test your lungs for a uh, some other stuff. So he tested my lungs and I had pneumonia. Fuck. So, but then still, I'm still not getting better from a cold. If you've got a cold, you, like again, you're probably getting better after three or four days. Yeah. This is like two weeks now. So doc, look, I'm not getting better. We need to see, do something about it. So he finally went for the swine flu test. Had this horrible thing up my nose. Oh, it was horrible. So done that, come back, swine flu. So uh, they- Assuming to, like mm. you came here for the transfer, right? Mm. They took that long to do all those tests on you. Yep. Sounds like a very different system to how footballers are looked at in the UK compared to here, right? Yeah, to be fair, I mean, look, I came, I came prior though uh, to that move. Okay, I did come prior to have a little look around and had a little train session with the boys. But obviously, in transition from there, from the UK to uh, Australia, that's where, I, that's where I caught it. Yeah, but like I said, I was, <clears throat> I felt like I wasn't getting better, and I said to the doctor, "Look," and like he said, "Yeah." In the end, swine flu. So what happened in the end? I was in quarantine. Yeah, they put me in quarantine for about 10 days. Right, so you did it before it was cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you did it before exactly. it was cool, bruv. So uh, I was in, a, I remember I had an apartment in Henley Beach. Yeah. They put me up on there and then like I said, the club used to like deliver my food outside my my door and yeah, just it was horrible. So I was on my own for 10 days, just suffering, suffering. And obviously in the end I got better. But from there, I was always on the back burner. So my sort of Australian transition football wise didn't really pick up and but luckily look I'm here now so yeah. I'm here to tell the tale did um, if that happened in UK I know what the UK banter is like if you went into the changing room straight after that you would have been getting banter left right centre was oh. it the same here not really you know I would have got like you said if it was in the UK the boys would have they would have killed me but it, it was uh, a bit different here the sort of perspective of players in this country is a bit different compared to like like what happens in the UK yeah. uh, 
I guess the guys were a bit more reserved. Yeah, uh, a bit more relaxed, but uh, yeah, but luckily I had a good bunch of boys, I had a good bunch of teammates when I was. That's good. That you made lifelong life. friends, or oh, without a doubt. Even after I left the camp, I left left the club in the country. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I came back and still there's people like Scott Jamison, Travis Dodd, who was my captain at the time, Robert Cornthwaite, who's working for Sky Sp- uh, Fox Sports and everything, and people like that. I still keep in contact to this day. So uh, yeah, it's great to have some great lifetime That's friends. That's sick. Was um okay. So going back to. Obviously, your accent, everyone's wondering he's living in Australia. He came from the UK. Where are you actually from? Originally from Slough. Okay. So I was born and bred in Slough. So it's okay, man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought East London was bad. <laughs> but after James told me about Slough and, uh, is it Bracknell, Bracknell those areas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, look, so Slough, obviously, it's just, uh, you know I mean, uh, southwest of London, uh, 20, 25 minutes from London. So, yeah, born and bred up there. Uh, played all my junior football uh, in Slough. Were you born in Ghana though? Or? No, I was born in UK. Okay. My mum and dad from Ghana, uh, came in, they came in the early 70s and then I was born obviously 76. And then yeah, raised, raised there. And, 76? Yeah man. I'm How old, old does that make you? Oh, man, 44 now. Oh my God, <laughs> You look so good though. Thank you, thank you. You look so good, bruv. Oh my days. Whatever you're using, what are you using? Mercy cream. <laughs> Mercy cream. Mercy. And Ghanaian genetics, bruv. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. And so, you started football there and you started, you got, you went straight into academy or... No, I was just playing local football. Okay. This junior football association for a team called Britwell Devils when I was like 10, 11. And then from there to a team called Crusaders. And then I didn't sort of get into the academy system until uh, 15. So I, I got one year at uh, ex School of Excellence at Crystal Palace okay. when I was 15. Uh, and then obviously that was to transition to hopefully to get the YT, YTS at the time, the youth training scheme. Uh, unluckily for myself, I wasn't good enough deemed it by the club from Crystal Palace. So they released me after a year. So I just went back into a, to the non-league circuit, went back to my local team, Slough Town. Just played for them as a under-16s to under-18s. But within that time as well, I was on occasion playing for the reserves at Slough. And then luckily, I got the opportunity to play for the first team. Wicked. And is that where you signed first professional contract? No, so it was just a, obviously, semi-professional, semi-professional. Com- yeah, conference uh, at the time. Uh, I was 18, signed a two-year deal with Slough Town. And then uh, luckily, a couple of years later, then I signed my first professional contract. And at Reading? Brentford. At Brentford. Brentford. So were you the, were you the big target man? Yeah, I was, to be fair, I wouldn't even say a big target man then. I was more of a speedster. Yeah, Because okay. of, of my athletics background, I was more of a getting behind. Uh, but I was quite, I was obviously big for my age. Uh, so you were doing athletics before football? Yeah, athletics before football. Is that why you put your kids into athletics now? Yeah, I think it's the best concept for kids just in general for all sports that they want to do. But uh, yeah, like, like for myself, I was doing a bit of athletics and went into football. And then, uh, yeah, I uh, played for Slough Town, got into the first team. And uh, luckily, two years later, Brentford signed me up. So how many goals that first season? First season was uh, a nice little 25. Yeah? Yeah, in, in 56 appearances. That's sick. Yeah, so it, look, for me, coming from non-league to the professional environment, I wasn't expecting that at all. I was just expecting to sort of just be a bit part player. I ended up playing every single game that season. And... Uh, Ended up scoring a winning goal to win the championship as well. So, yeah. and I scored three hat tricks as well. My, ass. <laughs> you said that with chest. <laughs> you said that with chest. <laughs> so, what I've realised is, and I wish I had this confidence while I was playing. Right with what I do now, with all of this stuff, social media, all this events, all that stuff, I go in with the attitude of not caring much. Mm. I wish I did that with football. Mm. I care too much. Would you say the way you performed from those goals, say from that first season, was it? You got the goals and it just gives you a whole different level of confidence that takes you on to the next game feeling like I'm definitely going to score another yeah. goal. Or yeah. was, is, it, is it the confidence thing? Because obviously you've got athletic ability, yep. but it's all in your head, right? Yeah, for sure. And do you feel like a lot of footballers suffer with that? Yeah, I, I was just, I, I was fearless uh, growing up. I just thought, you know what I mean? Because of, like you say, I, I had a bit of pace, I had a bit of, bit of strength, but I just thought, you know what? No one can tell me nothing. I just want to be the best I can be. And uh, every time I went and stepped on that pitch, it was about scoring goals and being the best player. And luckily for myself, I believe that really happened. And that's why I ended up scoring 25 goals, leading goal scorer in Division 3 at the time. So it was all good. What was it like signing that first contract? Oh, well, nearly, nearly didn't happen. Really? So I, oh, mate. So I had this agent, right? This agent called Lan Rioki. Oh, my days. <laughs> okay, I want to have it. He was an absolute. Oh, so he, he was a barrister. Okay. So my, my mentor, Danny Bailey. You yeah. probably even know Danny Bailey from me. He's from. Well, East London way anyway. Danny, ba- is he the Millwall guy? No, nah, he was the he's an ex player, Danny Bailey, Trevor Bailey. He uh, he doesn't sell her. He sells Schmerble life, doesn't he? 
Is it Glenn? No, no, no. It's no, not him. No, no, not Dan. Different okay, guy. That's different a different guy. guy. Yeah, you so, know what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah. innit? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Danny was my mentor at Slough Town. Like, he was a player, ex pro. So, yeah. uh, I used to look up to him and he used to give me a lot of guidance. So, he introduced me to this agent called Lanry. Yeah. So, in like I said, I was doing really well at non league. Yeah. And then a lot of clubs. Because when I made my debut for Slough Town, I'll go back again. I scored four goals, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> four goals my debut in the conference. And uh, a lot of clubs are talking about, oh, this young boy, Lloyd, we used to scoring goals. So, uh, the following season, I went on loan. So I went on trial to Walsall because Loud Town, uh, what happened was the chairman didn't believe that he was going to pay extra money to get the stadium up, up to date so we could uh, stay in the league. So we got demoted. But me being a player, thinking that's not fair for us youngsters who were there. So Brian McDermott, he sent me out on a, on a four-week trial to uh, Walsall. Okay. And uh, two weeks into the trial, he's phoned me. He said, Lloyd, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm just on my way to training. He goes, I've sold you. I said, what do you mean you sold me? He goes, I've sold you for, for £25,000 to <laughs> Brentford. I went, yeah, whatever. He goes, no, serious, I have. He goes, listen, go into Ray Graydon and say thank you for the opportunity, blah, blah, blah. So I went in to see Ray Graydon and said thank you for the opportunity. And he said, look, Lloyd, fair play. We wanted to see you for another couple of weeks, but you've got an opportunity to become a professional. Take it if I was you. So I said, thank you very much. So headed back down the M6, met Brian at the airport. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, tell her. I met him at my mum's house first. Then me and him drove to the airport because Brentford were flying out to La Manga for pre-season training okay. so while we were in transition I phoned up the agent and said Lamb you know I said we've got to go to the airport he goes yeah I've just heard that Brentford has signed you uh, let me I'll meet you at the airport we'll go and talk the contract at the airport at the airport before you go off to pre-season before yeah Brentford were oh, going off to pre-season okay. so I've got uh, so I've met up me and Brian got there and then uh, it was Ron Nodes may he rest in peace and uh, Ray Lewington uh, the Crystal Palace assistant manager now ex-England assistant manager with Roy Hodgson oh. so uh Lammy's turned up, he's come from Marlebone. So uh, Ron knows, goes, look, we, we're going to La Manga now. Here's, here's the pre-contract, have a look at it, see what you think. So I'm thinking in my head, buzzing man, professional footballer. Man. Yeah. There was me like on 50 pound a week and then this contract comes up. So I look at it, I'm like, wow, 350 a week, <laughs> thousand pound a goal. I'm like, oh, thousand pound a goal? Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah, it was like 2,500 a year signed off. I'm like, this is dreams are made of. <laughs> so anyway, Lammy takes the contract off me. He looks at it and says, no. I'm like, what do you mean no? And he goes, this offer is derisory. My client's not signing this. And one of those goes, well, well if you don't want to sign it, we're, we're going. I went, nah. I said, nah, we need to sign this contract. He goes, no, we're not signing it. I said, nah, I need to find Danny Bailey. Okay. So I called up Danny. I said, Dan, listen, one knows he's offered me a contract here, three year deal. Yeah. I don't care if it's fifty pound a week. I want to sign it. You better tell Lamy, Lamy saying he doesn't sign it. It's not enough money. You're hungry. Hungry. Isn't I'm just You're hungry. I just yeah, yeah, play now. Yeah. So Danny speaks to Lamy, and Lamy in the end, Lamy agrees. Okay, if the player wants to sign, the player can sign. And when I signed the contract in the end, I frigging got rid of him. So he was gone. So yeah, and then obviously one knows and the players went off. And then in the following few days, I, I met with the uh, club officials just to sign the the, the, the main the, pro, yeah. the, pro, the, the main contract and then have a medical and uh, just started doing a bit of training with the boys who were left behind. And then as they say, the rest was history. Sick. And how many goals did you score there? Uh, so like I said, that first season was 25. It was 25. 25, yeah. that first season, 56. I played every game in the end. Uh, 56 games 25 goals 3 hat-tricks winning goal to win a championship Jeez. it was just word of over stuff did you um, did they renew a contract after yeah so I signed uh, cause obviously signed a 3 year originally then I think into my second year I think into my second year signed another 2 years because like, yeah I signed another 2 years because I ended up being at Brentford for 4 years my first spell there yeah. and uh, yeah and then went up to the next division up which we did we did okay with, for a team who who was just come up we did okay the second season and then the third season we stayed up as well again and then the fourth season when I was there, my last season <coughs> in my first spell, uh, uh, Steve Koppel came in. And we had a very good team, very exceptional team, and we were obviously going for a promotion. Unfortunately, last game of the season, we drew with Reading. Uh, they needed a draw. We needed a win to go automatic. And then we ended up going through the playoffs. And then we <coughs> lost the playoffs. Uh, I think it was 2-0 to Stoke in the end, which was unfortunate. And then from there, the team really got dismantled because obviously we're all up out of contract and obviously players wanted to sort of progress yeah. to the next level to the league, uh, to the championship or premiership. And yeah, like I said, the team got dismantled. And uh, Do a lot of these conversations happen between you guys that as footballers, like Lloyd, how much you want? Right, how much you want? What's going on here? What are you going to do? Are you going to come back next mm. year? Like, does that happen a lot? Yeah, it does. Look, especially my my era. Freaking, we're talking 20 years ago, aren't we? Yeah. So like, yeah, a lot of that does. Because at the minute, there's so much more money, right? <sighs> Ridiculous money. Ridiculous. Like if you were playing at this time, you probably wouldn't be working right now. Oh no, man! If I, I mean, if I was in today's, if I was in today's era, because I've heard some of the contracts at Reading, oh, as football, and I'm like, Phew. yeah. I mean, if I was, if, if honestly, I'd be, I'd say, if I was in today's era as a centre forward in a championship, even League One, uh, I'd say 
I'll be earning at least 20, 20 grand a week. That's mad, isn't it? It's crazy. That's crazy. mad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, mad, mad, mad. Do you do you um do you understand why kids can go off the rail? When well, I mean kids, they're eighteen. They're not technically kids, but mm. I've I've spoken to a lot of like pro footballers and some eighteen, nineteen year olds. You talk to them, and it's like they haven't had any reality in a sense. As maybe in your time, I know you played football because you loved it, right? Mm. It wasn't for Instagram. No, no. It wasn't to do this, to no. do that. It wasn't to go Ocean Beach no. Club and do this, right? Mm. It was because you loved the game. And yeah. I think I remember there was, a, there was an interview where Seedorf was talking about this. And it was like, they used to go play out in the streets for fun because they loved it. Exactly. Not because of the money, not mm. because of this. Do you feel like it's completely changed where now the motive is just cash and just that? It's just cash and, fa- and fame. And for me, especially these youngsters, there's a ma- massive, a massive message I want to say to these youngsters out there, especially like, they all say they play for these teams, Man United, the Man Cities, Liverpool's 89, they're on getting their 10 grand a week, driving around in their Bentleys, whatever. And I, I, I sort of, first of all, I think I disagree with that. That shouldn't be happening, that kind of money be, being given out to youngsters. And secondly, they, I don't even classify them as playing for the team. Uh, there's a great saying by one coach, he said, I think it was, uh, I think it was Pep Guardiola. He said, uh, these players don't play for Man United and Liverpool's. They train with them. Until they play a first team game, that's when you play for the That's team. That's when you play for the team, yeah. So all these youngsters you see on Instagram, they're not even, they've not even made a first team appearance yeah. and they're trying to floss around in their Louis Vuitton wash bags. Because the first team result dictates how well the club does, right? Exactly. Not, 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 not that you're scoring goals in the under-18s. Yeah. You train, at the moment, you train with Man City's or whoever. Until you get into that team regularly, that's when you're a first team player. Yeah, because you see a lot of them drop off, right? Like that's they it. sign their first contracts, they think, yes, 10, 15 bags a week, whatever. Because I've heard some of the contracts in Chelsea, 18... <laughs> That first contract, I'm thinking, what? Massive money. This is crazy. Mm. Well, that's mental. And you can see why you wouldn't be as hungry. You, mm. you can already made it. Yeah, exactly. Like, if, I'm, if I'm generating £20,000 a week, I'm thinking, rah, I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> that's what a lot of them do. And bless them, I tell you, someone, two, two players who I admire so much for many, many years, a lot of people know these guys, Kieran Dyer and Titus Bramble. When they came from Ipswich to uh, Newcastle, Sir Bobby Robson, may you rest in peace. He was very articulate and clever with these two boys. It was, they were on good money, yeah. like 80, 90 as well. They were like 40,000 a week. <laughs> but Titus told me that Bobby used to take their money, a lot of their money, and put it aside for them. So smart. So smart. So smart. So smart. Put it aside for them, put it in a trust or wherever it was, and they lived on whatever they had their X amount of money left, and the rest of it was in the trust. And obviously by the time they get to retirement, they're okay. Sorted. They're okay. And them two are doing very well for themselves. I think that's why it's so important to have like good parents when um, someone is starting to make good cash. And I've seen a prime example of that with Michael Hector. Mm. He's such a fa- he's he's such a family person. I think that's why we get along mm. so well. And his mom, his dad, and I've known him since I was like six years old. Mm. And everything that he does, it goes. He does it with his family. Yeah. And you can see it doesn't go to stupid things. Whereas maybe if his mum and dad wasn't on his case initially, he's not doing it in a forceful way now, obviously. But if those um, fundamentals weren't there, those ethics weren't there, then it could easily just of course, go off the rails. end yep. very quickly. Mm. And I know a lot of parents like listen to this. And what would you say to them? Yeah, for me, it's a matter of just, you got to be real, you got to be realistic, you know, uh, don't be, Believe in all the hype and and fame. Just let your your son or even daughters as well in in the game because the women's the women's game getting big as well. You know, and they're getting a lot of money. It's just about making sure that they can uh, have that sense of reality in regards of obviously yes, you're getting the money, but be wise of it. Maybe yeah. the parents, like you say, take their money aside, put it in a trust for them in the savings, buy some properties, look into investments, and then at the end of the day, if you keep working your hardest, your hardest, then everything else will, will come second. What was it like starting at Ghana, playing for Ghana? Oh. I know you did that. Four games? Three four games? games? Four games for Ghana. That was... Uh, that was another, I mean, I was... Mum and Dad was proud, didn't it? <laughs> oh, no. Like, hey. <laughs> hey. They were, they were. <laughs> they were, innit? So uh, I was playing for Reading. I get a phone... I get a message. I was at the training ground. I get a message from Sue, who was a club secretary. She goes, oh, Lloyd, the Ghana FA have just called us. They want you to come and play your game. I'm like, yeah? She goes... That's unreal. Oh, yeah, and I was like, oh, wow. She goes, oh, yeah, they're playing the game in uh, France. So against against a club team, FC Nantes. So I was like, oh, wow. She goes, okay. She goes, look, I'm getting all the details for you, blah, blah, blah. So like, as you can imagine, England to France, it's not a long way, is it? It's not, no. Mate, it took me three days to get there. What? <laughs> it took me three days to get there. They put you on a cheap flight. Oh, man. So, yeah, so me, me, and, me and Patrick Adjiman, me and Patrick Adjiman got called up. He was at 
AFC, he was at Wimbledon at the time, I think it was. So we get called up. So because it was cheaper to fly direct from Heathrow to France, yeah, they sent us, we went to, uh, we went from, no, I went from, yeah, to Stansted. Yeah. Stansted to Belgium. Oh my God. was Belgium to, f- Belgium to France, somewhere in France. It wasn't even nowhere near where we were playing. And then we had to get some bus or something. I can remember, some, I think a bus or something picked us up and we had a two or three hour journey up there. It was unbelievable. Oh it was crazy. God. So, uh, but look, it was brilliant. And that was an era of when uh, a lot of the youngsters, because no, this was bad. I didn't really sort of follow my, my motherland at the time, you know. And yeah. obviously, you had these youngsters coming through, like the Essians, Asamoa Jans, yeah. Sulima Tai. But I must admit, mate, man, when I made my first training session, no word of a lie, we'd done this keep ball session. Yeah. And uh, I just had to stop and applaud. I just had to stop and just applaud because. Essie and Suleiman Tari. Oh, you were uh, playing, you, they were all there? Yeah, with them, these, yeah, these Essie and all them. Yeah, they, they were, were all youngsters. there? They were youngsters. Yeah, they were all the Stephen Apia, Asamoah Jan, uh, John Mensa. The list was endless and I was just like, I just stood there just like this, applauding because you could not get the ball with these guys. They were so technically gifted. It was unbelievable and then obviously that's the era, that's when... Wow, have you got crazy history? Oh, man, it's mad, mad. More people should know about. I feel like not enough people know about this. <laughs> mm. That's mad, bruv. Yeah. You're talking about some of the greatest oh. like midfielders. Oh, unbelievable, unbelievable. Top, top, top players. What were their ethics like compared to the boys from the UK in when it comes to the money, family? Was it more disciplined? Humble, humbled. Yeah, I'm telling these because they've come from nothing on the yeah. streets of Africa, Accra, Kamasi. These boys have got an opportunity to obviously better themselves and obviously look after their families. Yeah. And uh, I look at, like I said, Essien, and I remember, I mean, he was playing Leon at the time and Stephen Peel, I think he was at, I think he was at Juventus or at the oh time. Oh my yeah, days, yeah. that's mad. It's, like, it's how big these guys were playing. And then, like I said, look, they were earning obviously good money then, but they were so humble guys. They were just, just down to earth, very, very cultural, very, very spiritual and just very relaxed guys. And I, and I loved, I took a lot of from them, even, and they were younger. These guys yeah. were younger than me as well. So I took a lot from them and uh, I've got a lot of respect for them. And like, even to this day, I still speak to a lot of them. you speak to him? Yeah, I spoke to Essien last week. Oh, yeah. sick. He done, yeah, he actually done a, a friend of mine, Steve Cabber, reached out to me to uh, get a message for one young boy who's who's got a disease and he's a massive Chelsea fan. So I reached out to Michael and uh, Michael sent a lovely face face message to the wow. boy. So it was, yeah, it was nice. You know what? It's... um. You know, like on Instagram and stuff, you see those feeds where like footballers, I don't know, they give their shirt to kids or mm. whatever. Or they, or you see the kid walking down um, before coming out into the pitch and they see a player. They're like, oh my God, this is mm. amazing. It's crazy how much power a footballer has and how happy they can make a child. Because when I was a kid, that's all I wanted to mm. do. That's all I wanted to see, like meet a footballer. Like I remember like meeting someone for the first time, my hands were shaking. I was like, my lip, you know that bottom lip? <laughs> <laughs> you know that bottom lip? Just and just them with. just like rubbing your head, you're like, oh my mm. God, I'm so, I feel amazing. I'm, I'm so inspired. You have that fanatic sort of an inspiring community in the UK and Europe, obviously. Mm. But in Australia, it's a little bit different, isn't mm. it? Like it's not as, and I've kind of noticed, it's, it's, a, it's like that with a lot of sports. So like the top rugby league player could be walking down Bondi. I I don't think no one would go up to him. No. You can get, well, may, obviously, probably if they saw David Beckham, they'll go up to him. But I don't even think they would expect to see him mm. somewhere like this. Because there is that, which is great. They leave people to their private lives here, yeah. which is great. But that fanatic competitiveness isn't really here, is it? No, it's not here at all. Uh, to be fair, like say, I guess because the UK is the home of football and people just love it and it's, that's their passion, desire, we're here. There's so many diverse sports as well. Mm. So because it's so across the board, you've got the AFL, the cricket, the rugby yep. league, the football, you know. So like you say, when you see someone walking down the street, people even, even if they, like you say, people wouldn't even, wouldn't even sometimes even recognise who they are. Yeah. Just, and if they do recognise them, they just let them go on their way. And if if, if, if anything, just a little, oh, just hi, that's it. It's, you know what I mean? Where in England, it's like, oh, can I have a picture? Can yeah. I have a, can I have an autograph? Like, you know what I mean? Did you did you miss that going from, because any club you went to, and every time you go back to the UK, you get called up to the club, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You became a legend at each club because of your personality, mm. you know? And did you miss that when you came here and there wasn't as much of that here? It's, you probably have it now because you've, you've been here a lot longer. Mm. But did you miss that going from the, uncle, can I please take a photo? Or to come in here and someone's maybe waving at you. Did you miss that? Yeah, I did. But in a way, for me, it sounds strange, but it was probably a bit different when I came here. And again, obviously being black as well. Okay, yeah. Especially when I was in Adelaide. Actually, when I did get to Adelaide, obviously I was like the so-called marquee player. 
Yeah. I sort of, every time when I was out in the streets or in the, in the shopping mall, or go out in the evenings, people would always want to come up and yeah. like talk. They're like, talk. oh, it's a black guy. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other black guy. It must be so, like. So <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's how it was though. That's the thing. This because, was, because it? Because yeah. I was in like, very rare any black guys are in the area. So people would see me and they'd say, oh, hi, hello, Lloyd, obviously, can I have a, take a picture of autograph? So, but I understand where you're coming from in here. It's not as much where it is in the UK and Europe. Yeah, yeah. Because even like, it's mad because when I see someone here and I'm like, if, if it's someone that, is like big time. I'll go up to him and be like, "Oh, I love what you do, man. Mm, I'll mm. be, I'll be real with it. Oh, yeah, I yeah. can't even hold it in, you know." And um, sometimes they get shocked here mm. compared to say um, uh, the UK. They can't kind of expect it. They're like, yeah. "Come on, let's have a photo." Mm. And it's weird because the last couple of times I've come here, I've had people come and taking pictures with me, and I'm yeah. like, "This is fucking crazy." Mm. I'm it's like, "Fair play to you." I'm like, like I said, I see a lot of your Instagram people are following you well now that you've done well for yourself and it's, it's a nice feeling, you know, people respect it. And you see people walking down the street and I say, oh, that's the Darren. You know what's mad though? I always wanted your job, bruv. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But what was I like? You saw, you didn't really see me play, did I you? I saw your bit. No, I mean, at centre half, you know what I mean? Nice left foot though, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, you got the left foot though. I must have got that a left bit, foot. Left. A, bit, a bit stiff, a bit yeah, stiff. Yeah, you don't get many left-sided centre halves. So uh, you, you enjoyed, you came and had a bit of an experience in the, in the NPL world. So uh, yeah, at least. It was hard though. I can imagine it's different culture, different country. You know what I mean, different types of different style of football. Where you in England would be used to that real rough and tough, yeah. and everywhere here's a lot of pass, pass slowly, yeah. slow, slow. Where a defender's not used to that, where they are in England, when they're always up up against a striker, yeah, up hard. You, know, you yeah. can't say nothing to the referees here. Can't talk to them. It's can't mad, it's crazy. Man, you can't say anything. Like, Ref, what are you talking about? Yellow, bang. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. You can't say nothing. Uh, and um, so being here. Initially coming here for football, mm. you end up having kids there. Yeah, well, got- I, I had my, my daughter was born in UK, but my son was born here. Yeah. Oh, was your daughter born in UK? Yeah, AJ was born in UK. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. And then your son here. Yep. So now they've got Aussie passport, British. You're going to get the Ghanaian as well. Could as well, and they can get Dutch as well. They can oh, have, swear. Their, their, mum's, their mum's Dutch, so they can have the Dutch oh, as well. Get all of that. I know. You need to, that would be sick. Because, boy... I've got English and Turkish. I wasn't good enough to play for any of those countries. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if I had a few more options. <laughs> <laughs> Might have got a chance. <laughs> maybe, maybe if I had a few more options. And What is it like um, having kids in Australia? Because obviously you've experienced that mm. in the UK. Uh, and I have this conversation a lot with my friends. And they're always like, no, I'd love to bring up kids yeah. in Australia. I'm personally, I mean, I'm not too sure. Oh, okay. I'm not too sure. Although I love the life here, mm. I think some of the stuff that I went through in East London and some of the stuff you would have gone through has mm. made you a stronger character. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? For me, I mean, I was living in, just before I left here, I was living in South East. I was in uh, Rotherhive and uh, that's what made my decision to move here, to be fair. I was in the back, I was in the kitchen and I looked out the window and I saw these young ghetto boys in the, in the park smoking weed, like 13, 14 year old boys. And I yeah. thought to myself, I can't have, I can't let my daughter live up like this. Yeah. And to be fair, that made my decision easy. And that's when I decided to up ship and and pack our bags and and come to Australia because I knew the lifestyle here was was very good. Yeah. Fresh, safer, uh, and just just just, just I've just felt like it was better. So made made the, the move to come, and I've not looked back. I mean, I emigrated two thousand and two thousand twelve. Tw- yeah. Uh, March 2012 and oh, the, yeah, in a long time now. So I've not looked back, and then my son was born here, and. Uh, uh, for me personally, it's, it's it's probably the best move I've done. It's not about me. It's for the next generation. It's for them. So have the opportunities in the world of sport, education, everything. And yeah, I was gonna say. So with that happening, as soon as you had your firstborn, was it like it's not about me anymore? Mm. Straight away, was it like that? Yeah, yeah. Instantly, yeah. As it's like is it, there's no doubt because obviously you do get parents that just walk away or whatever. But is it that? That response straight away, you're like, it's not about me. That's it. Yeah, that's how I felt. It's just about my kids. Let them get the best opportunity that they can in life now. And as much as I miss my home comforts, don't get me wrong. And obviously, our immediate family is all back home. They've all every single one of their cousins is is back in the UK. And how uh, often do you get to? Oh, I mean, I've they've only they've only been back once okay. uh, since they've got old. I mean, they went when they were younger once before. That was like six, seven years ago, and then we went two years ago. So. Uh, we try obviously with all this pandemic now. Hopefully, in the years to come, we can try and go. I'd, I'd love to try and aim to go like maybe once every couple of years, ideally. Yeah. But uh, again, it's all about what's what was, what's going to be better for them in the long run. Enough, and I just feel like here in Sydney, Australia, it's, it's the best place for them. 
Yeah. And they've got, um, they play a lot of sports right now. Yep, yep. They play a lot of sports and then, would you love your son to be a baller? Uh, or your uh, daughter? Yeah, I mean, look, I must look, every, I guess every dad who's, who's, who's been a professional footballer would love their sons to emulate them. And But like I said, with me, I don't, I don't push him. Uh, I just let him be just subtle he, pushes yeah, small, I'll, small. I'll do I'll do that man. I'll play mind games I'll be like no no don't play football don't play football don't play football and then be like no I want to play football I'm like yeah that's what I want mm. <laughs> so, like, it's a fair play to me does it everything on his own back to be fair he, he loves his football loves his athletics he's even done a bit of cricket at school as well uh, but I hope look if, if he if he ends up being a professional footballer it'd be a, it'd be a beautiful thing but at the end of the day I just let him do whatever he wants to do as long as he's happy the mad thing is that's great the mad thing is if he wants to be a baller, you got all the connects. True, Isn't yeah, it? which is look, I got, I which, guess. which makes a big difference, it right? Does, it does. You know, what I mean, people say it's a bit of it's a bit of luck and who you know. It, sometimes in football, it is. So, I mean, if I can give him, if I can open a couple of doors for him just to get when he's a bit older to maybe get opportunities for tra- training or trials, then yeah. happy days. Why, why wouldn't I use them connections? You know? Of course, yeah. I mean, you worked hard for them. Exactly, you did a lot to get to that position, mm. and maybe your son or your daughter can take maybe what you wanted, maybe a bigger career or whatever it is to a whole different level. And who better to guide you than your dad that has experienced exactly. all of that, you know? Exactly. Because I feel even like, I'm excited to breed, bruv. Mm. I'm ex- just for that, just like as an experiment. Mm. Not to like, because I think it would be pretty cool having like having a, a mini you, mm. I and guess. It's true when I see my little boy sometimes, I mean, he does, I mean, the stuff he does now, I, I can even do it at that age, at eight years of age. Yeah. Some of the stuff he does, I couldn't even. I've seen him. He's an athlete. Oh, yeah, I couldn't he's even do nothing stuff. So when I just see him now, I do have that little pride in my chest. It's like, yeah, that's yeah. my boy. And has there ever been a moment? Because you do get. I, get I, I hear some parents go, "Don't have kids," mm. and then, but they say that. But then I see him with their kids, and they're like, they're having such a good time. I'm like, why do they say this? Have you ever had that thought in your head? Nah, yeah, I've always like said. I mean, for me, as soon as I've had my kids, I never feel like oh, I wish I never had kids. You know, but. They just bring a breath of joy to you, you know. Just yeah. every day you see them smile and breathe and out and about. It's just, it's just, it's priceless. It's the best feeling in the world. It's the best okay. feeling in the world. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And now you work in a school, yeah. and I think that's definitely due to your personality and why we call you uncle. And now you're helping out other kids, not only in sport but in school in general. Yeah. Do you want to tell us what you do now? Yeah. So now I work at a school called Cranbrook, which is one of the most exclusive schools in Australia. Okay. Uh, is it like a private school? Private school okay. boy. Yeah. School. A uh, boys' school. Uh, in the eastern suburbs uh, so w- I've got a couple of roles there now uh, I'm the general duties master GDM and uh, first 11 head coach so I work alongside the house masters and uh, director of students with all discipline matters uh, detentions investigations uh, so it's a real it's a great my role because I'm not a teacher uh, as as per se but I'm sort of that big brother uncle to the boys so it's just it, it just works beautiful for the school. When they saw me, just when I was just there as a casual coach, the head of the senior school, he just saw me how the boys reacted towards me when I was around the place. And he just thought, this is a, if we can have this guy in our school who can bring that sense of togetherness with the parents or with, or with the boys to the teachers and have that synergy together, have that middle man who can direct and talk back and forth to me. Because the kids, like, because I'm not, because I'm not a teacher, I'm more, because I'm like from London. Mate, you're cool. Because exactly. You're cool. And that's what and kids, yeah. I want to respect you. Mm. I wouldn't ever disrespect you because I've got so much respect for you for many reasons because mm. you give me time you mm. message you do this your mm. uncle yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you know and I think that's so important and mm. I had that in my school with uh, in essence you're like a Champions League mentor mm. right yep. you're a mentor yep. Yep. right and I had that and every time I got into trouble my mentor Alex used mm. to come see me used to be like what's going on I used to be like alright cool you know what okay I apologise he was like do you need to do that like, mm. no I don't just I get you. And whatever he said, I respected. Sometimes I feel like in school, teachers, I wouldn't say a chip on their shoulder, but there's that element of power mm. that when they mm. take the piss with some kids, yep. you know, and I've seen it, I've experienced it. There needs to be more people like you to have that grounded level of coolness, relatability, yep. as well as like inspire them. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, one of my mentors is a footballer. Mm. Who is it? Like you Google them. They're like, oh my God, yeah. this is so cool. And like, they want to be exactly uh, guided by, you know. And where do you see that going? Oh, look, for me, again, I think long-term, obviously, ideally be at the school for long-term because it's such a great school anyway. It's, it's, it's a top school. Uh, and I just want to be like, like you say, be that, that guy for the boys who they can relate to, who they can talk to, with issues or problems. And obviously then on my side, I want to maybe 
add some extra strings to my bow. You know, I want to maybe go and do some courses in regards to PR, uh, pastoral care side and and maybe maybe psychology side to 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 a certain extent. But I just want to get into. I think you that. already have that, bro. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's life skills. You know, I that's guess straight from that. yeah, straight from street. So I think sometimes that already. I think that that kids more appreciate that more than going to go and get all these papers signed off. I think because because I've had it from the street, kids can relate to me and they can talk to me about anything they want and. I think that's I think that's my long term goal, really. Hundred percent, and I think it's mad to think because I know, and I embrace them now more than ever after so many people tell me I've got a similar sort of like mindset where I'm from and like kind of knowing how to talk to people, mm. and it's mad to think that a lot of people they do degrees in this, right? Yeah, but we would have learned it in a more natural way by mm. taking action, and it's like learning on the job. Yeah, yeah. right. And it's hard because sometimes I talk to people, ones with degrees about these topics and they'll use this big word I can't even fucking say. <laughs> and like, this is, this is this. But they're like, you're you're already, you're actually doing that doing now. Already. And I'm like, mm. oh, cool. I just mm. need to, I guess we need to make it sound it cooler, bruv. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. What you got a master's in? Life experience. <laughs> Life. And I think, I, think that's, I think that's the most powerful thing, you know, to be fair. So I call it, I call, even when I'm on the football pitch, I call it street smarts. Yeah, street like smarts. Street yeah. smarts. I just uh, you know, so if you've got street smarts, you, you, you're halfway there. Really. You're halfway there. Would them, um, would you go into coaching here? Yeah. Like, as in, are you, what are you qualified with coaching? Yes, I qualify. I'm, I can coach in, in, in uh, A leagues if I wanted to and everything. And, First so, team A league? You yeah, yeah. What have you got uh, your UEFA? I've got uh, AFCA license. Okay. Uh, but for me, look, it, it's a matter of uh, stability, really. In the professional environment, I've had a, I've had a few opportunities to go and, and help out with coaching, assistant coaching here, there. But, I'm thinking to myself, really, you look at any, you could any, or especially the football side, it's about results at the end of the day, yeah? So if you're in a professional environment and you go as an assistant or whatever and then the club's struggling, you look at, you're, you're getting sacked and then you're looking out for your next paycheck. Yeah. Well, I don't want to put myself in that. I'm 44 now, I've got a family, I want the stability. So yeah. for me, I'm, I'm in a good job. I know what I'm doing. I'm still involved with football though, which is yeah. good. So I'm, I'm doing the first level at school and I'm still, even in the NPL world, I still help out and, and mentor and guide some 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 clubs, Absolutely. the club I'm with Ride or Me, I do the striking training. Yeah, yeah. So I'm still involved. So I'm happy, you know, I'm blessed. I don't need to be in that professional environment. I hear you. If, okay, Manchester United called you tomorrow, right? They called you tomorrow. Said, Lloyd, I've been seeing all the good work you've been doing with the kids at school. Mm. We need someone like you around. There's no weather but you're a Manchester United, going to put your kids into school, we're going to give you a nice house, but you get to do what you do now, which you love, uh, what I would say is a higher level. Mm. Would you do it? I, I think, you know what, I, I think that's a perfect job for you, you know. I mean, that would, I mean, I would probably have to say I probably would because it's in, it's in that professional, real elite environment. Uh, it's, I love football. I think and, you would shine there, bruv. And working with, with top kids, uh, I think I would probably have to say, yeah, I'll have to jump at that kind of opportunity if it's in that environment. Would you try and do that? Oh, mate, anyone out there, you know what I mean? All these big, big clubs, <laughs> any, any big clubs out there, that's what you're looking for, someone to mentor the kids at your clubs. Uh, that could, I mean, look, Because could I be think that's like, I think that's such a big missing thing. The middleman between putting other people together. I think it's mm. so underrated, you know? There's so many people like us, I would say, that maybe don't have those, specific skills that require to get uh, hired for certain jobs mm. and then on that end and then you have another end of specific skills but these fuckers their brains don't click together when then you have guys like us that go come here mm. I know a way to to, to, to syn- get that synergy together together mm. to maximise all this potential you mm. know and I feel like there should be more jobs like that and I don't even know what you'd call it <laughs> I don't even know <laughs> yeah. what you'd call it but I think clubs need that because so many kids are lost. Like you, I know you would pick up, you go to the gaffer and probably go, he's having trouble at home. That's why he's not playing well. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You can see it, you can sense you it. You can see it, you can sense it by things that they say. And I think mm. that's so important for athletes because so much of it is up here. For sure. Right? And I guess that's why it's so important to have people like you around. Mm. But um, yeah. yeah, man. Never know. Like, if anyone's out there, like we said, come knocking. Oh, uh, yeah. United, <laughs> City, you listening? <laughs> All the Arab clubs. <laughs> All the Arab clubs. Big man, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Beautiful. Can you tell people where they can find you? Guys, you can find me at Lloyd Awusu Official on Instagram. Uh, Lloyd Awusu. What's my football one? Yeah, Lloyd Awusu Football. Uh, Lloyd Awusu Facebook. And uh, Lloyd Awusu 
on Twitter. So yes. get following peeps. And um, if you do see a big black guy in Bondi <laughs> or in Sydney, <laughs> it's most likely him. Yeah, definitely me. Definitely me. Uh, peace and love, everyone. Make sure you subscribe, share, especially with all your football fans. Peace and love. Take it easy. Peace. Boom.